201. Today we're going to be talking about accessories for use on your ADSS cable. I'm Mike Riddle, uh, Executive Vice President here at INCAB America, and we're going to get going. First of all, uh, we are RCEP compliant. This is uh, to get continuing education credits. Uh, to get the continuation credits uh, after the webinar, you will receive a email and in the email it will include a link. Uh, you have to take a test, uh, pass the test with 70% and then uh, we will grant the credits through this registered continuing education program at rcep.net. And this the the fact that we're compliant does not mean that they endorse uh, any of the content. So the today it's uh, ADSS Engineering 201 accessories. So we're going to teach about the accessories that are used with ADSS because in order to have a working system, you have to have the cable and certain accessories. We're going to pay particular attention to dead ends and suspensions or supports uh, because those are especially critical. Here are our learning objectives for today. Learn about the two basic dead end types, understand about tension coupling, understand about suspensions and supports and why you might prefer one over the other. Talk a little bit about vibration dampers, about splice enclosures and the other items that you need to complete a system. Webinar rules are, uh, we've already done the introdu introduction and sound check. The presentation itself is gonna take about 50 minutes. Uh, after that, we'll have a, a question and answer session through chat, or last time we tried to uh, make the microphone available to anybody. We'll give that a shot again. But in any in any event, we will take questions in one form or another. Uh, the questions need to be about the topic today, ADSS accessories. You know, we don't want to talk about ongoing uh, business with Incab America. Um, uh, but uh, technical questions are great. So let's get started. So first, uh, to orient you, recall that when we talk about ADSS, that there are a lot of ADSS designs out there and variations on them. You've got double jacket versus single jacket, and then you've got uh, aramid for strength versus fiberglass yarn for strength versus FRP rod, and uh, you've got uh, you know different core designs and. The outer jacket might be polyethylene or it could be track resistant. Uh, there are a lot of things that go into an ADSS cable, but um, don't worry. It, the accessory selection uh, is not as nearly as complex as the cable design is. So as a general guideline, uh, ADSS dead ends and suspension clamps or supports and all of the other accessories are specifically designed to work with ADSS cable and in particular to limit the radial pressure on the cable. It's a dielectric cable, which means it's plastic, which means you have to be particularly concerned about radial pressure on the cable. <laughs> I wanted to comment about availability for project planning purposes. Uh, the historical lead time uh, was stocked to eight weeks, but um, you know now lead times are going out because of all the craziness over the last two years. And what's gone on over the last two weeks has not helped that any at all, I'm sure. And I just want to comment, you know, I find pictures on the internet. Um, I, I appreciate the pictures from the suppliers that don't mind me using that, and I apologize to those uh, who don't like that. Uh, I, you know, people often distill things down to, well, what do you recommend? And so what I've done here is I've put a little green check mark besides a couple items that are in the category of Mike likes. Um, that's just my opinion. 
uh, I don't uh, get any uh, paid endorsements or anything like that. Uh, they would have to offer me a lot of money to get a paid endorsement for me. <laughs> and, and even then I would disclose it. So it's just my opinion. So here's a schematic overview of ADSS and kind of a typical application. Yes, ADSS can be used in transmission applications, but I've uh, opted to show it in what's more typical for a distribution application. So you've got your uh, splice enclosure. There's sometimes a debate about is it a closure or an enclosure or a splice case. Uh, they all basically mean the same thing. Uh, I don't want to get uh, overly uh, uh, pedantic about my language on that. Uh, this is a, a particular type of um, in-span storage. We'll talk about that later. You've got supports. Uh, you've got suspensions. Uh, you have dampers, uh, corona coils if they're needed, cable abrasion protectors, uh, of dead ends and uh, the actual splice enclosure itself. Um, we're going to talk about most of these things. In the interest of time, I opted not to discuss airfoil spoilers because those just don't come up very much. And uh, corona coils are specific to tracking resistant cables, and I talk about them more in the uh, ADSS in a high electric field presentation and just uh, cable abrasion protectors. Uh, quite candidly, I just overlooked them. Uh, maybe I'll mention them in passing when I get to the end. Just kind of a written list view of it. So with dead ends, you've got two basic options that we'll discuss, the formed wire and the wedge. Uh, suspension versus supports, each of those has uh, flavors within them, and we'll talk about those. And huh, I just noticed this says suspensions with three styles. Yeah, that's right. Uh, connection options, we'll talk about that. Dampers, spiral vibration dampers specifically, down lead clamps, splice enclosures, and then the other items. So we'll talk about each. Okay. Dead ends are arguably the single most important accessory. And so it comes up first. And up first in, in it, there are two types, as I mentioned. Uh, formed wire is the first. And basically, it's the same design concept as a conventional uh, guide grip. Uh, what you'll notice uh, in this picture is that if you look very closely, you'll see that there's a layer of structural reinforcing rods put over the cable first, and then the actual dead end. And I say notice the thimble clevis because uh, you always have to use a thimble clevis when you're working with a dead end on ADSS cable. Uh, you need to make sure that that's included when you order uh, the dead end. Usually it is, and you have to go out of your way to order the dead end without it, but it is something to check. So um, dead ends roughly uh, range from length, uh, a typical length is about four feet uh, to about 70 inches, um, almost six feet. Uh, and here's one of those concepts I want you to understand, and this uh, this is the coupling zone. So you have a, a tension in the cable out at mid-span, and it has to transition from the cable to the dead-end body, then through the connecting hardware to the tower. And the area over which that transition occurs is called the coupling zone. And that's uh, important for any type of cable th that's being hung in the air. Uh, OPGW, uh, phase conductors, uh, but it's especially important when you talk about it with ADSS because, again, remember, it's a dielectric material, which is a fancy word for saying it's plastic. And uh, so you want that zone uh, to make that transition very gently and easily. Um, when it's abrupt, basically you're creating a stress concentration and that can cause the jacket to tear. 
So that's why this is important. And that's one of the major advantages, in fact, the advantage from a technical standpoint of the formed wire type dead end. Whether it's used on ADSS or any other type of cable, that's one of its principal advantages. Or technically, it's it's it it's its principal advantage. In addition, they tend to be inexpensive and they tend to be readily available. Uh, but there are some disadvantages and that is their length. They can be over eight feet. And that means that a lineman might not be able to install that uh, from the structure itself, which therefore means that you're gonna need special equipment such as a bucket truck. Um, the length it also makes that installation harder, which is another way of saying it makes it longer. So um, there are disadvantages worth concern. And yet on balance, I still think this is the best dead end of the two we will discuss. The second one being the wedge type dead end. Uh, it's perceived to be easier to install. They are inexpensive. Uh, I should have put here availability is good too. Uh, and you can install them from the tower or the pole. But uh, big disadvantages, no rods to protect the cable and a much shorter coupling zone. So back here, the coupling zone was on the order of feet or meters. Here, it's on the order of inches or centimeters. And you tend to get stress concentrations uh, towards the mouth. Um, in the real world, uh, you know, these could work and maybe even should work, but in the real world and in my experience, there have been a disproportionate number of problems with them leading to slippage, so the cable pulls out, and uh, jacket tears, which are especially bad. So I know they will hate me for saying this, but the my recommendation is that you avoid this type of dead end with your ADSS. So here are some examples of the problem in the field. These were the pictures that I could find. You can see how the jacket is separated and this has exposed the aramid. Uh, and basically this cable is done. Uh, it's gonna have to be replaced. Now, damage, not always. And it's not even always caused by the wedge type clamp. There have been field failures that would look just like this with formed wire type dead ends. Uh, but as I say, my experience, these have disproportionately caused more problems uh, than the formed wire. And the formed wire dead end is a basically a bad job of coordinating between the cable supplier and the dead end supplier. And I'm gonna be giving you some guidelines on when and how to do that. So this is really for those formed wire dead ends that there are uh, four ratings of them plus a special consideration when you're working with a cable that has a track resistant jacket. The four ratings are light, but sometimes uh, the manufacturer will call it light with the uh, just the TE spelling or mini, but the concept is the same. Then you move up to a limited, a medium. And by the time you're at a medium, it also tends to cover track resistant jackets. We'll check, we'll talk about it more. And then a high tension. And again, also for TR jackets. Let's talk about each. And how, well, really let's talk about how do you know which category or which rating to use? So first, you need to match the cable's maximum rated design tension maximum rated design tension or MRDT. And that's sometimes also called maximum rated cable load. Uh, they mean this exact same thing. It's just uh, the IEEE standard adopted this terminology uh, instead of this terminology, but they mean the same thing. So you match the cables MRDT with the dead ends maximum loaded tension. And we'll show an example in a minute. Then you match the cable's outside diameter with the range of the dead end. Uh, when you have a track resistant jacket, it's absolutely critical. I'm going to say that over and over again today that you work with both the dead end manufacturer and the cable supplier. 
When track resistant jacket is used, it tends to be used, not tends, like overwhelmingly is used on 230 kV lines and above. And what comes with those uh, UHV lines is longer spans, right? Which means the uh, performance requirements on the cable system are greater just because of the span length having been increased. Uh, and that jacket material itself, there are different formulations of uh, track resistant jackets, but again, um, because they're different and because some of them can be a little bit softer than polyethylene, uh, standard polyethylene, basically these two facts mean be careful. And so you need to work with both your cable supplier and your dead end manufacturer. And by the way, that prevents finger pointing in the event that you have a problem in the field like those pictures I showed you. And by the finger pointing, pointing I mean the cable manufacturer saying, well, it's the dead end supplier's problem. It's his crappy dead end. And the dead end supplier say, no, it's a crappy cable design. So let's next up. So the within each uh, rating here, here's when you use them. So a light, you need the cable MRDT to be 800 pounds. Uh, that's quite low. So that right there tells you that the use of these is uh, very limited, even though it's called light and not limited. In theory, they could do 300 feet, but uh, I kind of wonder about that because of this. Uh, the jacket needs to be a standard polyethylene jacket, whether it's low density polyethylene, medium density or high density. You don't see a lot of low density polyethylene with ADSS, hopefully, <laughs> but um, basically a whatever, a polyethylene jacket. Uh, and you don't want to use them for a critical crossing. So a highway, a river, something that's in particular very important. Um, if you could use it, but it is a critical crossing, what you should do is upgrade to the next rating. So the limited, the cable MRDT less than 2,500 pounds, the spans less than 600 feet, standard poly, uh, medium or high density polyethylene, and again, not a critical crossing. Now, in case some of you are furiously taking notes and you're also thinking, how the heck am I gonna remember all of this stuff? Please don't worry, you don't have to. What's really going to happen is you'll find similar guidelines in the accessory suppliers catalog information. They have other stuff in there besides, but when you break it down, like for example here, maximum loaded 2,500 pounds, which is what I wrote uh, two slides back, but also this thing about thousand pounds, maximum initial stringing nominal tension. Well, my experience has been, this is really what governs. If you meet this, you're gonna meet this. It's that simple. So think of these as streamlined guidelines uh, so to, to illustrate the point today, but don't, to, you know, you're not expected to meet, uh, to memorize these. Uh, for the test, if you take the test to get con continuing education, remember it's an open book test. So just go grab a, uh, a vendor uh, catalog and you can refresh yourself on what the limits are if they come up in the test, which hint they probably do. <laughs> so to keep going. Oh, and then the other source that you have is that uh, you can request a copy of the, of the slides from today's presentation and you can use the information here as a reference. Okay, to, the, to continue going, the medium rating you do have to be concerned about everyday tension. So no ice, no wind, it needs to be less than 2000 pounds. Here's your MRDT limit. Um, a track resistant jacket is okay if you get it approved by both the cable and the dead end manufacturer. So you need to check in. And this rating is good for those critical crossings. Uh, a heavy rating, 
tension needs to be over 2,000 pounds and the MRDT needs to be over 4,000 pounds. So there are not a lot of cases of this with ADSS, and there's not a lot of cases of this. These are very special situations. So the workhorse categories are the limited and the medium. And if I distilled it down to a really, really rough rule of thumb, it's limited works in nearly all distribution applications, and medium is what you need in most transmission applications. So the tracking resistant, you're probably sick of hearing this by now, always coordinate with both the cable and the dead end manufacturers. Okay, so let's actually use an example of this. So the, these are excerpts from a typical ADSS cable data sheet. So these happen to be in cabs, but of course you'll find similar information somewhere on those of our uh, competitors. So in this case, they're on the data uh, on the data sheet. There was a statement: outer jacket is made of medium density polyethylene. So that's a key bit of information, and then. In the design details, there is maximum rated design tension equals 1,574 pounds or seven kilonewtons. So then you look at the information from the uh, dead end supplier, 2,500 pounds. So the cable MRDT is less than the dead end maximum loaded tension. So you're good to go on this point. A limited, so therefore a limited tension dead end is okay, assuming it's not a critical crossing span. And this information is from Preform Line Products, and I thank them greatly. So then step two, on the data sheet, you'll find the cable diameter, 0.516 inches or 13.1 millimeters. From that same dead end cut sheet, you'll find here's the range 0.511 to 0 0.542, 0 0.516 is in here. So this is the correct catalog number to use. So that wraps up dead ends. Let's move on to supports. Supports, you have the option of a plastic support or a metal support versus suspensions, which are metal only. Talk about the advantages and disadvantages of each. So supports are fixed. So you see, you can't see it very well in this picture of this dielectric support, but you do see it with this aluminum support where there's a through bolt that's holding the the support or connecting the support to the pole. And what that means is that if there's any tension difference between one side or the other, that basically the cable has to deal with that itself. Uh, why would you have a tension difference? Well, um, uh, span length differences that are uh, substantial, like one side it's 100 feet and the other side it's 1,000 feet. Uh, that would cause uh, tension and balance. But uh, wind and ice loading, um, the cable could get uh, ice loading on, one, on both sides initially, but maybe one side sheds first and then the other side still has ice on it. And then you can have a significant tension and balance. And, uh, I have to say, I, I don't care for that. Suspensions articulate, which means if there's a difference in tension on this side versus this side, the clamp will rotate just a little bit. And it only takes a little bit to leave uh, substantial tension and balances, whether it's this style or this style. Um, even PLP will hate what I'm about to say. Uh, the Support manufacturers tell you that you can take out 
this, these inserts that you can see. And that just leaves a like a hollow center here and that you can use that to pull your cable through. And I, I, I as a cable vendor, cable maker, hate that. I absolutely hate that. Um, so I suggest that you not use supports for as a stringing block. Use a distribution class stringing block. I just really don't think it's a good idea to drag your cable through a support, whether it's the dielectric version or the aluminum version. Uh, and, and if you choose to do that, you really should check with the cable manufacturer to get their OK on it. Because again, you risk finger pointing if you don't. If you pull in the cable and it's abraded or damaged in any way, um, the cable vendor might say, well, you shouldn't have done it that way. And the accessory vendor, of course, has said, well, it's absolutely OK. So who's really taken the hit for that? Well, in that situation, you are. So get it OK first. In any case, um, because of the articulation, I just prefer suspensions. You can tell that. And so if I use the support, I would limit it to less than 300 feet. That's Mike Riddle. But um, oh, let me finish this before I move on. Suspensions articulate, as I've talked about, even a little bit greatly relieves attention and balance. So I think they're the best for any span and all spans. And I recommend it for anything over 300 feet and for critical crossings. Uh, but let's keep going. Uh, support clamps, you've got two versions. You saw the plastic, which is typically made from urethane. Uh, span, officially, the suppliers say have two flavors of them. They have a light version, kind of like the light dead end for up to 300 feet. And then they have a standard version comparable to the limited dead ends that go from 300 feet to 600 feet. So I've underlined 300 feet here because really for me, that would be the limit. But in theory, they're OK for up to 600 feet. Um, at that point, you should check to make sure that the vertical load has not exceeded 1,000 pounds. Not likely, but it's possible, uh, especially under loaded conditions. Uh, they're limited to a line angle change or elevation change of 20 degrees. And I mentioned already you use a through bolt or you can use a banding with an adapter. But I want to go ahead and point out here that if you use a bolt or an adapter, it needs to be perfectly perpendicular to the line. Otherwise, you get a Z effect. So imagine, and I'm going to exaggerate it, but imagine that a lineman drilled uh, that the cable is really running this way, but the lineman drilled the bolt this way. In that case, the cable would come in here into the mouth of the support and then go at an angle through it and then come out the other side at an angle. Now, I've exaggerated that, but that's the effect that you would get. Nothing good comes from that. Only bad things can happen. Um, so, in a sense, then, what you've got is like another source of error, and I like to take errors out um, because linemen, who I love very, very, very much, they're near and dear to my heart, but I have seen them drill some bolt holes a little less than perpendicular through the line, to the line. So, my opinion, my experience. Anyway, the aluminum supports again, 300 to 600 feet again. Again, you've heard me say what I would limit it to. Again, check the vertical load. Um, I was surprised by that, but that's what the, the suppliers say. So I'm going with that. Uh, again, the 20 degree limit, uh, again, attached with a bolt and a banding adapter. So uh, these are how those generally look. And uh, the dielectric ones here, here are those inserts I mentioned that you can take out and use as a, uh, to pull your cable through. Here are the inserts here. Again, I don't like that. Uh, I, I wouldn't do that if I were you. 
So suspension clamps. Um, suspension clamps get the Mike Likes uh, seal of approval. Uh, you have a couple flavors of them and then kind of a sub variant. Um, this is uh, uh, an aluminum suspension. It can be used with or without the rods that you see here in the picture. So uh, the rods basically allow you to go from uh, up to 1,200 feet. So standard without rods up to 600 feet, no problem, uh, with the rods up to 1,200 feet. And the rods, you could put a Corona coil on if you have a tracking resistant jacket. Uh, you get a greater angle with these up to 30 degrees, which I like, and you get that articulation. And then note here that the connection is a bolt, uh, which could have like either be a shoulder eye bolt or you could have an eye nut at the end and then a shackle or whatever. There are other possibilities for a, uh, attaching, but a shackle is pretty common. And back to my hypothetical lineman who doesn't drill the bolt exactly perpend perpendicular. In these case, your shackle is going to rotate slightly to adjust for that. So again, more error proof. Uh, an AGS style suspension is another possibility. Uh, there you can get to at least 1200 feet and beyond. Uh, you do need to check with the cable and the accessory supplier though in those cases. That This is another instance where this is an unusual situation and you need to get everybody's buy-in. Again, the rods accept the Corona coil. And these have the advantage that you can go up to a 40 degree angle. Okay. And then you'll notice I didn't include a vertical load rating here just because that is really rare with ADSS cable. Very large OD, very long spans like uh, beyond the 1200 feet here, and heavy wind or ice loading. Basically, you need to get up to five. 5,000 pounds before you have to start worrying about this, or if you're using a banding adapter, you do have to be concerned about 1,200 pounds. But with most applications with ADSS cable, very, very rare for the vertical load to get above 1,000 pounds. But yeah, be slightly aware that that is something you may need to check. The connection op options for the dead ends, uh, overwhelmingly most common is a clevis eye extension link like this. And then an eye nut or a shoulder eye bolt. Um, and then the clevis that I already talked about. Um, again, double check to make sure that it comes with what you order. For suspension, the most common is a shackle. Uh, banding adapters are popular too. Uh, this is not quite a suspension clamp, really. Um, it's the best picture I could find, though, to illustrate the concept. Okay. So, of uh, of all of the accessories that we've talked about, what do you use? So, in, in my opinion, the first priority is that you have to verify that the hardware fits with the um, accessory. Uh, with uh, suspension clamps or, well, e with either, you need to verify that the assembly is consistent with the orientation of the attachment point. Um, but generally, whether it's a dead end or a, sus a suspension clamp, if you're with a support, I guess you don't have to worry about it. But with a suspension clamp, if you make a mistake there, it's easy to throw in an extra anchor shackle and that will fix the problem 99.9% .9 of the time. Uh, you, of course, you should consider what your company already is stocking, uh, price and availability, and then what you like. And then on the issue of when it comes to anchor shackles, uh, do you need, well, actually any kind of a bolt, do you need a bolt nut cotter pin, bolt nut, why can't I say this? a bolt nut versus a cotter pin. In my experience, the cotter pin alone works just fine. Okay. Uh, Aeolian vibration. Um, uh, 
Aeolian vibration in terms of damaging the cable is a problem for metal cables because uh, the fatigue resistance of aluminum um, is relatively low, I mean, compared to steel, but it's also relatively low compared to what you get with plastic materials. So it's not likely that Aeolian vibration itself is going to cause fatigue damage like it does with uh, any kind of cable with aluminum, but ADSS does tend to vibrate at higher levels. And so instead of getting fatigue jet damage, you can just get um, abrasion damage. Uh, you know, for example, at the end of rods. Uh, rods usually are your friend, but in this case, maybe not so much. Um, and the vibration can pass through to the connecting hardware. So what happens, um, I'd rather do it, go back here. All the way back here, what happens is the cable is vibrating and then that transmits to the rods and then that passes through the clevis, through the extension link and goes to your, um, to your structure. And along the way, anything that's moving can be wearing. And so you can get wear damage over time. So it's my view that AL, uh, SVDs ought to be used all the time uh, because you can get the wear on the hardware and they're, they're cheap. So I view it as cheap insurance against problems. Um, the only solution uh, is spiral vibration dampers for ADSS. So, uh, here's what one looks like. You have a smaller he helix to grip to the cable, but one advantage of of uh, spiral vibration damages, uh, spiral vibration dampers, is that they're not sensitive to placement. So, arguably, this doesn't even matter, but it, it's nice. Um, they're they're very effective, uh, very economical. Again, as I like to say. Uh, cheap in insurance. Uh, they have simple protection plans because they're not sensitive to placement. Typically, it's uh, what you see here, two per span up to 800 feet, and that probably covers more than 80% of ADSS uh, installations, um, and then four per span up to 1,600 feet. Uh, so this is probably 80%, and this is probably covering 19.99% uh, of the rest. Uh, they're easy to install. Uh, when you need more than two per span, you can nest them like this, which uh, helps speed up the installation process. Uh, really, the only disadvantage is that you can only use them up to one and a quarter inch on ADSS cables, but that covers 99.9% .9 of the ADSS cables today, so not really a strong disadvantage. So um, on balance, uh, I think they're great. I think they should always be used. Uh, it is good to coordinate, uh, double check your damper analysis and protection plan, again, with both the cable and the, the damper supplier. Uh, I've already given you the most common uh, placement guidelines, uh, but there are cases where you have to be careful. Basically, anywhere where the wind can get funneled into a very smooth and laminar condition, uh, you need to be uh, careful about. So those distill down to river crossings, uh, canyon crossings, and very flat open terrain. So terrain that's not, they're not, they're not a lot of trees or hills or buildings. Uh, in that case, in these cases, you might need to increase the damper quantity. And so you're back to work with both the cable supplier and the damper supplier. At your splice points, you're gonna need down lead clamps. You've got two basic types, plastic, which is typically urethane, typical one here, and aluminum. Both types work fine, but generally I prefer the urethane for uh, ADSS, plastic for plastic, 
and I prefer the aluminum for optical ground wire, metal for metal, but both work fine. So if you're in a pinch and only had aluminum ones available, I would absolutely use them without skipping a heartbeat. The mounting op options that you have, a lag screw works great for wood poles. So what you see here and what you see here. Uh, for uh, steel poles or concrete poles, uh, you can get a banding adapter. There are also adapters for lattice towers if that comes up. Uh, if you're working with a concrete pole uh, or a metal pole, you can just use a, a, a bolt if you've made provisions um, for an interface on the pole, but that has to be specified by you ahead of time. Okay, uh, I see some question or a hand raised. Uh, I will do that at the end. Splice enclosures, there are lots of enclosures on the market today, but basically uh, they break down into three types. You've got dome enclosures, Here's an example of one of those, and I say that today these are the most popular type around the world. Uh, clamshell types look like this. You have two halves that go together in a dome. Uh, you can see here the opening is at the bottom. And the, the guts of the enclosure slide up into it from the bottom. Uh, in a clamshell, the two halves fit together. And I think a little bit intuitively obvious that you're more like less likely to have water get into a dome enclosure than you are a uh, oh, somebody said the slides are not advancing. Alexis, are you? Oops. Has it caught up? Okay, now people are saying it's okay. All right. Uh, if it it could be that someone's internet connection is slow and it's not catching up with me, but it should catch up eventually. But more people are telling me it's okay. So uh, for those who are having problems, aha, okay, now the person is, uh, it's okay. Okay, so again, uh, clamshells, I think you can, you can kind of look at them and think that maybe there's a prob higher probability of water, but is that significant? We could debate that. My experience, they work fine but this this style has become more more popular uh, the only type that i don't like is the cast type uh, it's a very old design uh, and it's very prone to leak i've personally dealt with leak issues with this type of enclosure already talked about this um, already commented about this and then plus uh, they create an additional problem. Don't see a whole lot of cast types used with ADSS, so I don't want to dwell on that point. Okay. Uh, other considerations with your splice enclosures is think about your splice tray. Uh, 24 fiber trays coordinate well with most ADSS designs, but a lot of ADSS designs are still uh, 12 fibers, so a 12 fiber tray is fine. It's not that there's anything wrong with it. Um, so those are fine too. Uh, my recommendation, use what you like or even better, talk to your splice techs and see what they like and just go with that. But it is something to think about. And as fiber counts have gone up, uh, 288 is a very common ADSS uh, count today. And uh, 24 fiber trays are going to work better with a 288 fiber cable than 12 fiber trays. Um, cable storage. Do you have to store cable? Uh, there are racks for doing that. And I apologize that this picture shows OPGW. I just couldn't find a good picture that showed AD, ADSS, excuse me. And uh, is bullet resistance a factor? You know, that's where it's needed. So here's a bullet resistant housing here. And here's just a picture of a different design, does the same thing. 
OK. Snowshoes, I mentioned other items and I did want to talk about snowshoes only because I don't like them. Uh, I really think that a storage rack like this is better. There may be cases where you have to use one and, and OK, I'm not going to complain about it. I'm not saying never ever use them. I'm just saying I don't care for them. Uh, this is this concept is really a carryover from the strand and lash type uh, application of fiber optic cable. So you would hang a metal messenger and lash a fiber optic cable to it. But an ADSS is self supporting. So that means that if you're using these on your ADSS, you're putting extra load on your self supporting cable. Is that really what you want to do? Does that have any positive long term effects? No, I don't think so. I think it only has risks with it. But if there's some condition where you got to do it, go for it. But again, this is in the category of Mike's opinion. Uh, I just don't like these. So I'll just close out that we do have a software tool on our website uh, we call the configurator. Uh, there are several of them. Um, and there is a ACES uh, ADSS, which helps you pick the right cable design and do cost estimates and figure out your bill of materials and your real lengths and uh, even help with logistics. So that tool is available to you free of charge. Uh, just go to our website. OK, and now. We're done with the presentation and. Next up is uh, questions. So let's see how we're going to do that. Uh, you could raise your hand or submit a question in chat. OK, and. Let's see. OK. There's a comment here that uh, yes, uh, the webinar has been recording and it will be posted on our website later. Uh, I, I'm, you can share it with family and friends. Uh, another possibility, having you know trouble sleeping one night, yeah, just pop in a, um, go to our website and call up one of uh, our, our webinars and uh, perhaps that will help you. Ah. What about stacking tangents? Yes, I. I should have talked about that. Uh, let's go back. What's the best way to do that? Um, OK, hold on. I got a great idea. Oops. Let me close this for now. Uh, bear with me one moment. Do, 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 do. Where is my preform line product? Got a better idea. Stacking. Da, 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 da. Stacking. OK, stacking is when you do this. Let me keep going. So there was an ADSS cable installed here, and then you need to install a second one, and you can attach a support 
to the first support. And I have absolutely no problems with doing that. You know, you have all the same considerations. You know, I wouldn't use this for pulling in. Uh, you have to have good orientation, so perpendicular to your line. But, uh, you know, I still don't like supports, but the stacking is fine. No, I have no issues with it. Um, obviously, when you in install the cable, you're going to want the cables to have similar pro properties. So you would have to be careful if you installed, say, j just to give the extreme here, let's say you installed a big 288 fiber cable here pushing an inch in diameter, and then here you wanted to stall for whatever reason, a 12 fiber cable that's around uh, maybe 0.4 inches. The SAG characteristics of the two cables could be so different that under uh, wind loading conditions, uh, they could end up sagging into each other or blowing around each other. Um, nothing good can happen from that. Maybe some bad things could. I mean, it, it may be one of those things that it, it never causes a problem, but it could. But uh, I would be careful to make sure that the two cables are reasonably close and re and sagged reasonably the same so that you wouldn't get any kind of mid-span uh, clashing. Obviously, that's going to be more of a problem as the or a potential problem as the span length gets longer. So. Uh, these days, like the SAG and tension programs that are used, or in particular PLS CAD, uh, will do a clashing calculation for you. And you should be able to set up your ADSS cable, if, if you have any doubt about it, set it up in PLS CAD and check for clashing. Uh, that's my, my only concern there. Uh, and then with suspension, so let me go back. Uh, I've seen suspension stacked too, uh, but I don't have a picture of it. It's more commonly done with supports. So let me go back. Hope I answered your question. Ah, yes, the person, yes, sagging has been our issue. Yeah. Um, don't know what else to tell you. Uh, you might find, well, what you could do, like if you check and you find you're going to have clashing or that you have have to do it, is use a uh, a spacer uh, at mid span. Um, where would I have that information? Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Bear with me. Okay, uh, I'm not finding anything. Let's see what other questions. I, I might be able to circle back to that. Um, other questions? Uh, let's see. PLP. Yes, sir. Since I'm not seeing any other questions, I'll keep working on this. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so let me share the screen again. And let me figure out how to make this picture bigger so you can see it. If y'all could give me some feedback as to if you can clearly see this picture or not, I would appreciate it. We can't see it. They can't see it. What do you see? Just you. Only me? I thought I... Oh, maybe because I didn't share my content? 
go. Yeah, because they certainly don't want to see me. <laughs> Do you see it now? Yes, no, don't know. Yes. OK, good. So this is a helical spacer. And this is what I would try. But even this assumes that the two cables are reasonably sagged the same. Uh, someone commented here, uh, in span spacer will, uh, Tufik, hey, hi Tufik, will not create local flexing. So um, you would want to be careful about this uh, because you don't, if there's the possibility for movement, like under wind conditions, you want to make sure that this isn't going to abrade the cable. So I would probably use a set of armor rods over the cable, which actually just sort of moves the problem potentially if you're not careful, and use this. So if you have that problem, it's back to I can't really, this is the conceptual solution, but the devil is in the details you need to talk to both the cable supplier and in particular the accessory supplier but i'd get the cable supplier on board with it too but i conceptually i think this would fix your problem how much tension and set how much tension set and suspension and pole used in one kilometer adss fiber construction also supply i i'm sorry uh, I, I'm, I'm afraid I don't understand the question. This is far, uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I don't really understand uh, uh, the question. Uh, if, if you could clarify it, um, please, you know, let me know. Or if there are, uh, if there are other questions. Okay, I'm not uh, not hearing other questions. So, um, last chance, last call, raise a hand, type a note. All right, uh, I appreciate everybody's attention today. Just a reminder, if you would like to get credit for continuing education, um, the, uh, I do have, okay, a question came up. I'll deal with that in a minute. Uh, for everybody else, um, please uh, go to our website, um, or excuse me, if you if you want to get the professional education credit, please look for our email. It'll click on the link. It'll take you to a test, pass the test, and you'll get your credit. Uh, your that email, everybody's going to get an email. You only have to click that link if you want to get the professional um, uh, continuing education credits. For everybody else, uh, please feel free to give us uh, feedback. Um, you'll get like a survey with it, and please give us feedback. You know, I like to hear from people, uh, good or bad, or suggestions for things that I should be uh, discussing. Or, and if you dis totally disagree with me about something, feel free to let me know. You know, I'm I'm always open to learning myself, and really. Uh, I think of these as more an opportunity to share information. So I like to hear from you too, like what problems you're having, like the gentleman who asked about the sagging or mentioned the sagging problem he's having when he's stacked. Uh, and then the third link that's going to be in there is a link to the recorded version of this. So like I say, you know, share it with your friends and, and family. And uh, if you need it because you're up late and having problems sleeping, uh, feel free to, to take advantage of it there too. Uh, everybody else, um, thanks, and I hope you have a great day. And then for the person who asked about corona coils and rings, um, I really can't talk in detail about that now, but if you go to our website, you'll see that I did a presentation. In fact, here, I'll, let me do this. Uh, America.com. Uh, let me share my screen again.
So the okay. Hopefully you see our website. Give me a shout out if you don't. So here, uh, here are the past webinars. So for the person that's asking about the Corona coils, uh, this is the webinar to go uh, click on because I talk about Corona coils in there and in the context of, of um, uh, how you look at the electric field uh, for ADSS. Um, every, everything is there that, sh that you'll need and then it'll make more sense. Um, it, it's kind of, it, yeah, it's beyond the scope of today's presentation for me to, to say more than they exist. Uh, talk to the cable supplier and talk to the accessory supplier about them. Uh, but having said that, I will just quickly uh, just so that everybody knows what they are. So here's what we're talking about. So uh, Corona coils are used on uh, ADSS cables that are in a high electric field and with a track resistant jacket. So that's all I'm prepared to say today. All right. So again, thanks everybody and enjoy the rest of your day.